Good morning, everyone. All right. So we're going to talk about best practices for security in the cloud, right? So, or the new rules for cloud security. Hey, folks, this is live, so quite frankly, anything could happen. Even the, the name of the slides could change, right? And so uh, let's go ahead and get into it. So really quick, uh, we have an agenda here that's going to talk about some of the foundations for security. Uh, so uh, just a little while ago, you heard the, the safety message, where the doors are and, and, and how to, to, to get out of the room. Uh, we're going to continue that kind of theme, right? This is like the uh, safety card. So if you've ever uh, been on an airplane, they try to make the safety video fun, we're going to make the security video fun. So in order to do that, we're going to start with the thing that everyone at AWS starts with because our customers really want to know this. And this is the shared responsibility model. I'm not going to sing. I I've seen all kinds of people explain this in a lot of different ways. Uh, but the, the tenets of it is that AWS is responsible for the security of the cloud, and you're responsible as a customer for the security in it. So you're still, as you take your journey into the cloud, whether you're uh, a cloud migrator, an organization that is moving existing infrastructure services and applications into the cloud, uh, you're still responsible for if you have operating systems, a Windows operating system, Linux operating systems, you're managing your own database. Uh, you're always responsible for that data. But we do have some tools, we have some uh, methods and some processes that can help to uh, provide layers of security for that data. And so we want to take you through that. Uh, but as you can see here, uh, the customer is responsible for their data always. And it's, all, it's been said before at AWS uh, conferences that you should dance like no one is watching, but you should encrypt like everyone is. And we're going to talk to you about some, some tools that allow you to do that, right? Uh, and then you can see down here the security of the cloud. There's some things that you inherit immediately by being uh, on the AWS cloud. Uh, and that's things like uh, for audit and documentation purposes, you inherit things such as the physical security, the, the uh, environmental controls, all of the things that you have in a traditional data center, you actually inherit those things by being on AWS. And you, you also inherit a lot of other capabilities, right? The uh, ability to do encryption, uh, the ability to do things like multi-factor or single sign-on a number of different controls. Uh, so security of the cloud. So now we're getting into the, the behind the scenes of the, uh, the, the safety card, right? So like if you've ever flown or you flew to come, quick show of hands, who flew to come to the summit, right? So, so maybe you flew the same airline that I did and it was an animated video of a safety card and they explain what happens when you slide down uh, the slide and they didn't actually do that in real life. It was easier to animate it. And, uh, and we're not going to actually crush like uh, Thanos a, uh, a disk or to sanitize one, but media sanitization, as represented here, it does make a lot of sense that uh, there are controls for the end of life for physical devices that exist in, in AWS data centers, uh, as well as things like uh, proper climate control uh, and the physical security, who checks in, who checks out. Uh, we, we don't have uh, extraneous visitors. We don't offer uh, tours of data centers, but that's to uh, enhance the security of, of what we're offering for customers. So the security in the cloud, these are the things that are in the customer responsibility, but we do have tools and we do have a framework uh, that allows you to uh, kind of invest in building these uh, these fundamental blocks in your uh, business so that you can actually uh, secure your environment. Uh, what we call, uh, in, it's in actual multiple phases, but these are the preventative uh, controls. So uh, the best offense is a good defense. And in this case, uh, one of the things that we always suggest uh, for organizations moving into the cloud is to develop a strategy around using multi-factor authentication. So multi-factor authentication in a lot of ways is something you have, something you know, uh, but typically a hard access token, soft tokens, we recommend you use those uh, and, and kind of move away from uh, password schemes uh, and that way you have some layers to your defense. 
identity and access management roles. Uh, that is a way to define uh, what servers, uh, services, people, groups, et cetera, uh, can operate within your environment. You can actually create fine-grained identity and access management uh, roles within your organization, and those roles can even be assumed. So uh, in a traditional uh, compute environment, maybe on-prem, you, you may have had an administrator. That person or that service was always an administrator, whether uh, they were in the building or they were outside. With uh, strategies like assuming roles, you can actually uh, give a permission programmatically and for a period of time or under certain conditions. You may say that I want you to have this great access when you're doing this particular task, but when you're done with that task, uh, I, can, I can take that uh, away. Uh, or I can give that to a process when it needs it uh, and then operate under the principle of least privilege. So that's what uh, the programmatic access for IAM really is about. Uh, there are times in your environment where you're going to have data that you feel is in uh, plain text. And we do have a way to manage things that are plain text, encrypt that text, use only the encrypted hash. Uh, and that's, we have a couple of uh, AWS tools and we have partners that, that do those things as well. Uh, but the AWS Secrets Manager is another way for you to manage things that some applications may need in plain text, but you could actually use ubiquitous encryption with it. So a, a, another strategy for you to be able to uh, put another layer of defense into your environment. Uh, so networking is important. So when you move into the cloud, for organizations that haven't moved into the cloud yet, you still do have networking boundaries. In AWS, we call that a virtual private cloud or a VPC. Uh, that acts as your uh, networking boundary within the, within the cloud. And so you can define things within it, such as internet gateways or uh, you know, VPNs. You can define uh, things like subnets and ways uh, to, to secure individual resources. So you can use things, leverage things like security groups uh, to define access between devices. There's no access implicitly given between devices. So you want to build that in as your, your business and as your application dictates that. Uh, and then access management, having the ability to look at uh, the things that are going on in your environment and define who or what might have that access and then being able to audit that uh, so that you have uh, visibility to it as well. So uh, kind of going on here, uh, we offer the ability to use encryption in a variety of different ways. There, there are multiple ways to encrypt data uh, in AWS. Uh, and there's multiple ways to use encrypted data uh, so that you can protect uh, the things that you're putting into the cloud. I actually work in a program uh, called ATO on AWS, which is a, a program that was actually addressed in the, uh, the keynote yesterday. Uh, but that program is about using security and compliance and using all these layers along with some of our partner solutions uh, to build something that gives you that audit and uh, visibility so that you have comfort with what you're putting into the cloud and that you can also meet uh, compliance programs such as FedRAMP or uh, CGIS or any number of other uh, programs that use uh, that AWS has uh, some attestations to. You can actually build your applications uh, to those levels as well. Uh, so data in transit, data at rest, uh, fine grain access, these are some uh, processes that you can, you can put into your environment to offer security where in a traditional on-premise environment you may not have had that. So you can actually increase your uh, security by going into the cloud. So now we're going to put our detective hat on. So uh, I didn't bring one with me, I don't know why I didn't have a prop, but uh, uh, next year I'll do something like that. Uh, so the detective ones, did I just go backwards? Okay, uh, ignore the preventative there. This is detective. So like I told you folks, this is live, anything could happen. So uh, AWS CloudTrail, uh, every, so when AWS was started, uh, the decision was made to make everything API driven. That was a very important decision. The other decision was that everything is logged. Everything is logged. So every event that occurs uh, goes into CloudTrail. And you can use that for both uh, the real time, like analytics of who did what when, uh, but you can also 
archive those and do analysis of trends over time. So it's a very powerful thing for you to be able to go back and look at something that occurred after you've made different architectural uh, changes, right? So my architectural strategy or my security strategy may change over time, but I have the means uh, using something like CloudTrail and S3 to be able to investigate that. And I can see patterns that maybe people weren't looking for before. So, so it, it's a very uh, important forensic and analytic tool. Uh, capturing logs, you can capture logs from all types of events. Uh, the networking through the VPC flow logs, uh, the application logs through things like CloudWatch events, uh, and CloudTrail. So all of those things allow you to have visibility into the things you put in your environment. And then things like uh, doing change control. We have a number of integrations into uh, change control systems, but uh, in general, uh, you could use uh, things such as uh, pull requests if you're developing new applications, uh, and those events can be approved or authorized, and you can use that as a change control method. But those are all important things to help with uh, security. And finally, uh, being responsive, right? Uh, the idea of waiting for the administrator or uh, a, a human to intervene in a security environment, uh, I think we're, we're at the point where we want human visibility, but we want machine reaction, right? So the idea of using something such as AWS Lambda, which is uh, event-driven computing, uh, that can help you to remediate some, some issues and potentially auto-remediate so you can really limit the, the time that you're exposed because disaster always strikes when uh, we don't want it to, not when it's convenient for our administrator. So we don't want to be in a situation where uh, we have someone who's getting on a plane, they're disconnected, and that's the only remediation. So we want to build in that automation. So things like Lambda can help with that. Uh, things like the... Uh, the API gateways, any number of other tools. Uh, there are many AWS services that can help with uh, accelerating these auto remediations. Uh, and then just putting in good processes. So I'm gonna leave you with a couple of things. I'll leave this up here for a second if you want it right now. Uh, as was mentioned before, uh, all of these slides are gonna be available. This video is gonna be available. So if you, uh, you need something right at the, the end of the night after a long week, watch me on video and then you know you'll, you'll sleep well right so uh, i'm going to turn this over to my colleague but thank you very much thank you trey my name is Slavomir Legier. it's a difficult name to pronounce i know uh, and i'm vp of engineering and operations at mcafee mvision cloud business unit artist formerly known as sky high networks and what my team builds is something called cosby how many of you heard of cosby Okay, Cloud Application Security Broker. Uh, anyways, I'm not going to do the product pitch here. I'm going to talk a little bit more as a practitioner. Uh, I not only build the product, but I also use the product, and I want to make sure that you know we use the product effectively within our organization. We're a huge user of AWS services in general. So AWS and AWS security is very, very important to us. It's actually critically important. Just to give you an idea of scale, we're processing about 8 billion events a day right now for our customers. Our customers are mostly government entities as well as Fortune 500 companies around the world. So 8 billion events a day being processed through our systems. That's one event for each woman, man, and child in the world, uh, which is quite a scale. We process petabytes of data for data leak prevention purposes. And all of that has to scale, and it has to scale in a very, very secure manner. So when we look at where the data is, and that's really the critical component, you know, you need to protect your most important assets. Where is your data? And when we looked at, you know, what our customers are doing today and where they are storing their data, it's very, very apparent that a lot of data right now is in the Office 365, Google, etc. this type of applications uh, that allow people to collaborate. But there's also a lot of data in IAS applications. And when you look at how it changed over time, uh, it's really very interesting. When we started in this business about five years ago, shadow IT here was 90% of what our customers really cared about. They really wanted to know where their users are going on the internet, where they are storing their data in applications that are not allowed by enterprise, shadow IT. 
right? So people were going, instead of going to OneDrive, they were putting their files in Dropbox, for example. Not that Dropbox is insecure, but it was something that was really not allowed by the organization's policy. So that was the biggest concern, but that concern really narrowed down over the last few years. Right now, it's only 10% of, of the pie. The biggest part of the pie is collaboration, and the second biz biggest parts are really IAS, PaaS, so your Amazon, your uh, Google, your uh, Azure environments, as well as business SaaS applications, such as, such as Salesforce. I mean, Salesforce stores a lot of confidential data as well. So in order to protect all that data, you really need a comprehensive solution that goes end to end, from shadow, where we started, through the business applications, to collaboration applications, to IAS and PaaS. And today I'm going to focus mostly on IAS and PaaS components of it. So when we look at you know, where uh, everybody's going right now, uh, software as a service is really increasing quite rapidly. 20% is very fast rate of growth. A lot of companies are moving to Office 365. They're using Salesforce. Everybody is using software as a service. And when I made these talks you know, 10 years ago and I asked people how many of you use software as a service, there were not that many hands, even though people didn't realize that things like uh, online payroll applications were really software as a service. Uh, today, everybody would raise their hands. I'm, I'm quite certain of that. Uh, but when you look at the growth of IAS, basically Amazon, Azure, Google, that's growing at 38, almost 40% year on year. That's a tremendous, tremendous amount of growth. And when you look how it really happens, uh, a lot of organizations are moving their existing applications, so custom applications that they developed in-house, from their data centers to pu public cloud. Uh, but when you look at these two graphs, actually, what you really notice is uh, that not only are they moving the existing applications to public cloud, because that is, you know, the, the move from data center to, to IAS is decreasing by 24% year over year or so, but they're also building everything new in the public cloud. So they start there now. Uh, for any new application, uh, you know, it is really built in public cloud rather than implemented in the data center itself. Because as you see, that growth is over 50%. So tremendous amount of growth in the public cloud. And obviously being in that conference, you can see that growth. I mean, 14,000 people at the conference. Uh, that's quite impressive for, for the public sector alone. Uh, the average enterprise has over 500 custom applications that they developed. Uh, and you know, I've been in many enterprises that were average or maybe not average, but a lot of them were way higher than that actually. Uh, you know, and I, years and years ago I was at AOL, we had about 1500 custom applications that we developed. So that was, you know, 500 is a large number, but it's not unusual number for any type of large enterprise. And all of them have to be protected. And at the end of the day, as uh, Trey was saying, uh, it is shared responsibility. And that shared responsibility really depends on what type of environment are you putting uh, your application in. If you are putting it on-premise, obviously you're responsible for everything, from physical security to data security to, to authentication uh, to everything else. Uh, if you are putting it in SaaS, your responsibility is much more limited because SaaS vendors like Salesforce and others are taking care of most of the security responsibilities. They will take care of the data center security, physical security, uh, network security, application security itself. And the only thing you would be responsible in that space uh, would be really authentication, making sure that the right users are coming to the right application and, and, and using data properly. In IIS, it's a little bit of a mix. Uh, and uh, as you heard, uh, you're responsible for still quite a bit. Uh, AWS provides very good tools to help you with that responsibility, uh, but these tools don't solve all your problems and, and you need something else to help you comprehensively secure all of your journey to the cloud. So when you look at it and when you build custom applications in IS environment, in uh, Amazon, in Azure, in Google Cloud, uh, interesting part is that IT security a lot of times is not involved. At least it's not involved up front. They come later or they don't come at all. And the reason for that is that dev teams, frankly, really don't want to include security in, in, in their development process. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a practitioner. 
I really don't like the security folks coming up and telling me, you know, how unsecure my application potential is, is right? Uh, it slows me down. It doesn't allow me to innovate as quickly and move as quickly. So, so you know, in an ideal world, if I wanted to move quick, I probably wouldn't want the security in, in, in the play. Uh, DevOps is actually a little bit better, including the security folks in it. You can see 36% or so uh, DevOps uh, organizations do not include the security team. Uh, operations uh, are, are more amenable, I guess. Uh, but in general, I mean, security is something that a lot of times comes at the very end of the process. You do your engineering development, uh, you're ready to launch, and then security folks come in and say, hey, stop what you're doing and go back to the drawing board and make sure that uh, you are fully secure. This is not really the right way to go, you know, because there's a lot of uh, potentials for having security holes in, in your applications. And it would be much better if we could move that security uh, more upfront. Uh, so what are the potential security holes? What are the problems that you can encounter as you migrate to the cloud? Uh, one of the biggest ones that we've seen among our customer base is simple account misconfiguration. Uh, when you look at environments like AWS, uh, there's a lot of knobs and dials that you can turn. A lot of them are turned on by default to be secure, but you have a lot of developers in your organization. Some developers are really good, some developers are not so good, and they want to make their life a little bit easier, and they will turn that knob in a way uh, that will make it much easier for somebody to attack your application and make it less secure than it really should be. Uh, so you need to really make sure that you look at all of those configurations and assure that they are done in the most secure way possible. Uh, so some of the attack strategies that we've seen are uh, things like making uh, S3 buckets or any type of data storage buckets uh, publicly readable, writable uh, by anybody on the internet. Uh, one would think, why? Why would that happen? I mean, a lot of times it's a mistake. It's a mistake by some developer who didn't really think through what uh, they were supposed to do and then turn one of the knobs to make it publicly readable and writable. They tested the application, it worked. It did what it was supposed to do. I could write, I could read, works fine. They didn't test it from outside to see if they can actually read and write into these buckets and a lot of data was actually lost through that. Nobody had to break into anything. All they had to do is actually find that bucket and suck out the data. Uh, some of the buckets are publicly modifiable uh, or user modifiable because ACL controls are not set up correctly. Uh, that allows the attackers actually to not only read and write, but also plant malware uh, into the customer's bucket. And we've seen that actually happening quite a bit as well, uh, where somebody would use uh, infrastructure as a service to actually distribute their malware uh, throughout the internet, uh, which is very interesting. So some of the threat objectives are, you know, the data can be extracted, you can distribute the malware. Uh, if your VPC is not set up in correct way, it's easy for the application to actually traverse the network and get to the places where they shouldn't get to. Uh, and fi finally, if you misconfigure something and attacker gets into your network in IAS, they can actually use your services and you will be paying the bill for it, right? AWS doesn't care if it's you who runs the application and, and uh, starts a lot of the servers or is somebody nefarious who wants to do some Bitcoin mining. Right? The bill will come to you and, and you will have to pay it. So, so it's, it's really good to make sure that everything is configured right so you don't have that type of problem. So let's look at some real world customer scenarios and what we've seen in our customer accounts actually as, as we're working with them and, and the types of attacks that, uh, that they've seen and how they can be prevented. Uh, so there was a very large car rental company that we're working with and uh, they basically were putting credit card information in notes fields in the SaaS application. You know, I mean, something that happens all the time. You know, somebody calls, you know, instead of putting credit card where it belongs in the credit card field, sometimes, uh, you know, the, the rep will put it in the notes field. Uh, that obviously violates a lot of not only security principles, but uh, your principles for PGI compliance and other compliance requirements. Uh, so you need to really be able to scan that type of application, find out what data is where, uh, and make sure that it's actively protected. 
And, and for that, we have data leak prevention technology as well as activity monitoring technology where we can actually see what customers are doing uh, with SaaS application in this particular case. Big agricultural concern uh, had another problem. Uh, what they actually have seen is that their IP, and for a lot of agro companies, IP is probably the most important asset next to, frankly, the fields, right? Uh, but it's something that needs to be really protected and guarded very, very closely. And they found that some of their valuable intellectual property was stored in publicly readable uh, AWS Amazon S3 buckets, right? And for that, uh, we used configuration audit to discover something like that uh, and close that particular hole. So, so with one scan, one click of the button, we were able to scan it, find out that that's what's happening, that the data that shouldn't be really publicly accessible was publicly accessible there. Uh, and close that particular loophole. <clears throat> and again, data leak prevention allowed us to actually identify what kind of data is sitting there to make sure, because sometimes it's okay to actually leave the bucket open, right? I mean, that's what you want to do because you're collaborating with customers, you're collaborating with partners, and you want actually to use it to share data back and forth. Uh, but in this particular instance, the type of data that was sitting in wide open, publicly accessible bucket was not something that should be uh, widely available to everybody. It was really confidential IP. Uh, very large insurance company uh, developed the custom applications. And what they've seen was that, uh, you know, when they had an incident, it was really impossible for them to investigate what happened, uh, how people actually attacked their applications, what did they uh, discover, what were they able to extract from the application, <clears throat> so, so those type of questions were really difficult to answer for them uh, until they put our solution in place and they could really see uh, what type of activities were going through the application, what was happening, uh, were these activities actually threats. Uh, so we have AI uh, type of uh, solution which allows us to look at all the activities and determine whether or not some of them may be threats uh, or potential threats and, and alert uh, our customers that, that this is something that, that shouldn't be happening. Uh, and finally, they, they needed to look at the privileged users and see what their access uh, was and, and how they were able to uh, use the application and whether or not it was all kosher or somebody had the credentials that they shouldn't have. So these are some of the examples of you know, what, what we found in our customers' accounts, uh, how they use our, our solution to comprehensively really protect them end to end from SaaS to PaaS to IAS. So, so throughout the entire cloud journey, not just uh, in IAS environment itself. So back to the shared responsibility model. For custom applications and for SaaS type of applications, you really need to guard the front door. You need to make sure that you know who is coming in, <clears throat> what are they doing with these applications, uh, how do they use the data, uh, et cetera. So, so, uh, ability to see you know, who the users are and how do they use it is, is very, very important. For IAS uh, specifically, because that responsibility is still partially yours, uh, you also need to guard the back door uh, and make sure that you know, somebody doesn't go through your network uh, and somebody doesn't attack the application that way. So you need to cover really all your bases uh, specifically with IAS. Some of the use cases, uh, what we found when we scanned actually all our customers and their use of, of uh, Amazon, Azure, Google uh, Cloud, etc., uh, we found that you know, typically <clears throat> our customers on average have about 14 misconfigured services uh, running at any given time. Uh, and when we pointed out to them, they say, oh my God, you know, I didn't really know that that was happening. Uh, we need to continue this configuration audit uh, process and make sure that we always close all those loopholes. We have hundreds, literally hundreds per customer DLP incidents uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and for that, basically we're looking at, at data itself. So files that are being shared in Office 365, uh, files and data that's being posted in S3 buckets in, AW, in AWS. Uh, data being typed into SaaS applications, such as Salesforce, Workday, and others, <clears throat> and, and making sure that that data is in the right place and it's protected in the correct way. Uh, so for any time that doesn't actually happen, 
we do generate a DLP or data leak prevention incident. Uh, and finally, we notice that about 5% of Amazon S3 buckets are open. Uh, and our customers a lot of times don't realize it. Some of it is, is on purpose and it's configured that way. Uh, but a lot of times it's not something that that customer realized that was happening. Again, uh, AWS provides very good tools, which by default will make these buckets closed. But there's so many knobs and, and dials and, and things that you can turn on that uh, either on purpose or by mistake, you can actually make that mistake. And, and you know, small percentage of the time it happens. but. Even if it happens once, your valuable IP may be lost or, or you may be spreading malware actually around the world, uh, not knowing anything about it. So you need to make sure that you do your configuration audit. You make sure that you have visibility into your data because data is your most important asset at the end of the day. And you need to make sure that you can detect the threats. So you look at all the activities that are happening in all your <coughs> cloud environments and do these activities represent actual threats. So how the data can be exfiltrated? We talked already a lot about misconfiguration. Uh, so it's you know very obvious one when somebody makes a mistake and not configures things correctly. Uh, we can have rogue accounts uh, that are created. Again, you are responsible for authentication authorization. You are setting up all of those accounts. <clears throat> a lot of times people leave. You don't block it. You don't close it correctly, right? Uh, sometimes you open extra accounts because you know some developers think that they need to have this account in order to access one VPC or the other. Uh, they forget to close it after the testing is completed and, and they are available to the attackers potentially. Uh, if you don't use two-factor authentication, those are fairly easy to break in, right? Two-factor authentication is really, really important. Uh, the data can leak. I mean, it, it leaks all the time. And you need to make sure that you have really good data leak prevention program in place in order to determine where the data is, how valuable is that particular data, and is it being shared with anybody that it shouldn't be shared with? Is it being entered into the type of fields or applications that it shouldn't be entered into? <clears throat> Just one idea, uh, one uh, example of the data leak that can happen very easily, and it happens in almost all of our customers. When we actually do shadow IT, uh, engagement and we look at you know what the end users are doing on the internet one of the things that they use and I, you know they don't really realize that this is a big problem uh, they use PDF converters uh, they receive the file in PDF and they want to edit it so they want to turn it into Word document or something like that they go on the internet and they search you know for the best PDF converter out there that will be able to take the PDF and turn it into world and one happens to be in Russia they don't know that it's in Russia they upload the document there <laughs> And it is somewhere that nobody knows where it is anymore, right? And the data leaked and somebody else may have a hold of it. Uh, so this is very, very typical use case actually that we see. Rogue user, uh, you know, in the government environment, that's probably more prevalent than, than in commercial, although in commercial, obviously, we have a lot of uh, people that are very interested in our intellectual property uh, and they can come in and uh, try to take the data. Uh, a lot of times when your employees are leaving the company, this is uh, potentially subject to, to rogue users exfiltrating some of the data. You know, it, our typical example for that will be our salesperson is leaving. They go to the sales force and they want to download all their accounts so you know, they can go and sell it to the same people something else wherever they go next. Oops, sorry. I'm a little bit too excited here. All right. Uh, so, so it happens, and, and this is something that you really need to monitor and uh, make sure that you have the ways to prevent that rogue user from, from take, taking your data. And finally, compromised accounts. If you don't have two-factor authentication, if you don't have strong uh, IAM policy, I, I mean, it's, it's fairly easy to actually compromise the account, get into somebody's account, and act as them, and, and take the data uh, without anybody knowing it, unless you have the right solution in place to, to prevent that from happening. So how do we do it? Uh, AWS and, and others uh, for uh, specifically we integrate with uh, native applications through APIs. As you heard, AWS provides a lot of APIs. That was the uh, base requirement for everything that was developed on that platform. Uh, the API set is very, very rich uh, and we embrace it and extend it. We don't really duplicate what, what AWS is doing because they do a really good job on, on, on major portions of it. We just extend it to, to go one step be, above and beyond 
uh, what's available. And for custom applications, when you may or may not have APIs available, uh, we can do reverse or forward proxy actually to look at the data as it passes back and forth. Uh, and with some artificial intelligence, we're able to map that application and really determine what is it doing, how is it being used, what data it stores, uh, is the data confidential and, and prevent data leaks and, and uh, attacks on, on those type of applications. So these are really two main methods, either APIs or, or proxies. So for best practices, Gartner really recommends to extend the CASB protection to IAS and platform as a service. So infrastructure as a service and pl platform as a service. <clears throat> as you know, CASB started really in the shadow field moved to SaaS, and right now it really embraces IaaS as well. So it's really end-to-end -end solution, uh, especially in the multi-cloud environment. So when you are thinking about being in multiple clouds uh, with SaaS, IaaS, and PaaS applications, it's really nice to have the single pane of glass to really show you your entire security posture uh, within that cloud environment. Uh, and you can read what Gartner is saying, but they basically say that in order to, to really migrate to the cloud properly, you need some solution like that. For custom applications, so things that you develop in-house, the typical use cases are advanced threat pre prevention or protection. Uh, so we look at threats, we analyze the threats, we detect compromised accounts, we detect what users are inside users, privileged accounts, and, and make sure that we lock those doors. Uh, we do a lot of activity monitoring, that 8 billion events a day, uh, that's coming from mostly activity monitoring. Uh, we're looking at everything that's in the cloud trail logs in AWS, we're looking at everything that's in your uh, SIM logs, uh, everything that's in your web security gateways, etc. cetera, colorate it, uh, run AI on top of it, and turn those activities into real threats and present you with the threats on which you can actually act. Uh, for data and data protection itself, you need really data leak prevention in the cloud uh, to see you know, what data is there, how is it being shared. It's so easy right now to go to Office 365 and basically say, share this document uh, with somebody outside of the organization. It's just one click, enter the email, document is shared, right? So unless you have something in the middle that can stop that sharing, uh, it's really, really difficult to stop it because it's not going through your network anymore. Your end user is going directly to the cloud and sharing from cloud to cloud. It's not going through your perimeter. Your perimeter won't see that type of action. So it's very important to have something in the cloud, some kind of security solution in the cloud that will be able to prevent that from happening. Uh, and finally, access control. You need to make sure that you define who can access the application and uh, how can they use it, from which device, from which location, uh, et cetera. And, and if the device and location is not approved, don't allow access to that particular application. So if somebody's, for example, accessing uh, my data uh, from US, from Washington DC, and 10 minutes later accessing from China, obviously this is something that should be a threat and, and we need to look deeply into that and then stop that from happening. On IES side, uh, main use cases really uh, center around managing rogue AWS instances. So make sure that your buckets are not opened, that all your configuration is done correctly and uh, that you check that configuration audit on, on a regular basis. Uh, you need to make sure that you monitor all of the, your resources. Uh, you need to make sure that you look at all the threats that come in through all those activity monitoring. Uh, you can have the forensics. Uh, you can have good visibility into all the confidential data. And finally, uh, you know, S3 buckets should be closed unless you really, really want them to be opened. So what's next? Uh, as I said, as a practitioner, I really hate uh, when my security team comes in after my project is done and say, stop everything, you know, we found the holes, go fix them, and that adds another two, three months to the project because now we have to reopen the code, fix all the security holes. Uh, so what we are looking at and, and what our customers and, and you all uh, should be looking at is what we call shift left. So move all those checks as early in the process as possible. Uh, make it fully automated so before the infrastructure is deployed, that infrastructure should be checked to make sure that it's done in the secure way. Before your code is deployed, that code should be checked uh, to make sure that it's done in a secure way. 
Uh, as the code is being written or as infrastructure is being written, infrastructure today is a code really at the end of the day. So as that code is being developed to build the infrastructure, those checks should be done very, very early in the process. So I don't have that problem when you know, I'm done with the project and the security team comes in and says, stop everything and, and go back to the drawing board and, and redo your security posture. I want to catch these problems early. I want to catch them uh, before they developed into, into real problem and fix them right then and there. And, and that's, that's, that's what my objective is. And that's what the objective of all of you should be as well in order to get your projects done on time and done in really agile fashion. So with that, I'll leave you with, let's see, with some of the resources as well. Uh, we developed actually definite guide to AWS uh, security ebook uh, that I will uh, recommend that you read. Uh, we can perform AWS vulnerability assessment for you. Uh, and finally looked at the MQs from Gartner and Forrester and everybody else, the magic quadrants, magic circles, magic whatever, we are on the upper right. So, you know, that's always a good indication of having a, a very, very solid uh, solution for that. With that, I thank you and open things for questions. Right. Yeah, thank you for taking us through that. Absolutely. So anyone that has questions, if we could have you come to the, the center microphone. And if you don't, we thank you for coming. <laughs> I'm but sure there are some there's questions. Gotta be, there's got to be questions. Yeah. Here we go. Hello, I've got a quick question. So we, we have a customer where we have built their entire network and infrastructure within a private network and in its on-prem everything. So we're trying to move uh, their workloads and infrastructure to the cloud. So, so you have a little bit of noise behind you. Could you speak up a little? OK. Um, so we're trying to move everything to the cloud. So right now, everything is on-prem, all the workloads and applications and, and everything. One of their biggest concerns is, is security, of course. So right now, it's, it's Prisma High. We have to have all these FIPS level two compliance. So how do we make a good argument and kind of educate them that the cloud, the cloud is as secure as, as on-prem? OK, well, thank you first. Sure, person. yeah, I'll, I'll get started and you, you jump in. But uh, I think that the, the track record that we've had with the, the auditability, the, the things that we're able to produce for uh, visibility into the environment is something that you don't always have on premise. So the question was around uh, security in a FISMA high environment. Uh, how does it compare being in the cloud, right? So the, some of the things that I mentioned, the, the idea of cloud trail, the ability to log things through APIs, it gives you visibility and it gives you reporting. Uh, in addition to that, beyond the, the security and the controls that AWS has, you also have the uh, third party attestation of us. 30 seconds right. and time. So we've, got, we've, got, uh, we've got an independent third party uh, validation and continuous monitoring and uh, review of the practices that we have as a, as a cloud organization. And then you as a customer, you have the ability to leverage not only our tools, and all of this, the services that we have, but uh, partners like McAfee that have these solutions that allow you to quickly remediate any issues that you may have, those are things that that combination doesn't really exist on premise. Right? It's so a, all, it's a, all these security controls satisfy the FISMA high requirements? So uh, in our shared responsibility model, uh, we adhere to what would be considered uh, FISMA high. And we have ourselves a FedRAMP high uh, for our AWS GovCloud. Uh, so we have the certifications that adhere to the, the NIST standards that, that you're operating for FISMA High. And then your portion of the responsibility, uh, you would have to validate that your apps adhere to FISMA High. Yeah, and, and the same from our end. We have FedRAMP certification. We're actually going for DOD certifications as well. Uh, so in this environment, I actually feel that and, and that's what I hear from customers now, actually, more than, than I've heard five years ago even. Uh, you know, the cloud in customers' view is more secure uh, than on-premise environment, partially because you're only responsible for some of the security, not all of it. Uh, a lot of that security is responsibility of, of your vendor provider uh, as AWS, mm -hmm. uh, but partially it's also because uh, is just really very well certified and looked after the environment. Yeah, yeah. Part of the part of the attestation is independent validation, as well as continuous monitoring and remediation. So, 
Uh, those are the things that help to build that base, but then there's still the portion that if you're running an operating system, you, you need to patch that operating system. But in our case, we have some tools that you can use natively to be able to help you remediate uh, any issues you may have. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Any other questions? Nope. All right. All right. Well, we thank you for I'll your time. I'll be here. Thank you. Yeah, we'll be over here. <laughs>